Welcome to Conversations with Des. I'm your host, Des Blanchfield. Today, I have the privilege of catching up yet again with Z Hussein. Z, great to see you. Thanks for taking time to catch up with me. Great to see you as well, Des. Now, to uh, introduce you to our audience, uh, Z, you're no stranger to my audience and, and my subscribers and followers and listeners and viewers and so forth, but just to reintroduce you to any new faces, um, you're the Senior Vice President of Global Business for Finance, Healthcare, Sports, and Entertainment and Industry Solutions for at t Business which really means that you're responsible for leading the business sales teams focused on bringing at t products, services, and industry-specific sales plays to customers in finance, healthcare, and all other industries headquartered in Eastern US. An enormous uh, challenge and, and, and fascinating to watch some of the things you're working on regularly, but we're in particularly special times now, given that we're currently under uh, a lockdown in many ways around the entire world with regard to COVID-19, uh, the derivative of coronavirus. So, so I thought we'd just kick off with um, how you're doing. I mean, this is a really crazy time. We're fighting this derivative of coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, whatever you want to call it. We're all fighting it together. And different nations and different parts of countries are in different stages of lockdown and response. But I'm just keen to sort of get to a sense of how are you doing personally? How are you dealing with the whole response to it and the work from home experience? Thank you for asking, Des. Good to see you. Uh, I'm, I'm doing fine. Um, you know, I was thinking about it. So this is uh, the fifth week of uh, this environment of work from home for me, uh, shelter in place for my whole family, and then virtual learning for my kids. So um, it's been very, very interesting, but we've uh, acclimated. You know, we built a pretty good routine. We're leveraging all of the collaboration tools. Uh, and we're doing well from a personal standpoint. Um, you know, from a business standpoint, um, I would say that uh, my teams have been incredibly busy. Um, you know, we always knew that communications, communication infrastructure is really important, but uh, at no time um, than now it has been more clear the impact that it has from a societal, um, human, business, and economic standpoint. So. Uh, it's, it's been really interesting. It's been really unusual, but uh, uh, the business has been incredibly busy. Well, congratulations on making the pivot. I think you know, a lot of organizations don't fully comprehend that when they do the pivot themselves, service providers such as telcos and, and, and other uh, critical systems providers uh, not only have to make the pivot commercially themselves as an organization, but they also have to support their partners and integrators and resellers and their stores and their customers and their customers' customers. And so, you know, congratulations on not just making the pivot as an organization as a team, but also keeping the lights on for the rest of the country. I, I wonder if we can maybe jump into some of that then. I mean, there's been a lot of focus on, on some of the frontline activity. I mean, for example, testing centers and hospital facilities that you work with, all of which are on the front line of this whole challenge. Uh, and, and they've been doing a lot of work to help us flatten this whole curve, as we say, and keep people safe and safe lives and deal with that at, at the very front line of it. But, you know, behind the scenes, I, you know, you're there and you're supporting them and working with them on a 24 by 7, 365 basis through this. Um, I wonder if you could share some insights on kind of what your team's been doing of late around this, particularly to help keep them running and help them sort of increase their capability uh, to meet this whole demand of late with regard to the last few weeks. Yeah, no, I think your characterization is spot on. This has been 24 um, seven. You know, first of all, I, I just wanna acknowledge uh, all our first responders, our doctors and nurses, our healthcare workers on the front lines. Um, you know, they're risking their lives uh, to save lives out there. Um, we're tremendously grateful uh, to them for all of the great work that they're doing out there. Um, you're right. I mean, healthcare has been incredibly busy. Um, with regards to you know what we've we've been doing to support the different uh, healthcare institutions as well as the workers on the front line, I'll give you you know different variations of things that we've been working on. Um, certainly, you mentioned uh, a lot of these uh, facilities now have to move a lot of data. They have to move it extremely efficiently. Critical information has to get from one place to uh, the other in a reliable. Um, and uh, in a really fast manner. So initially we've had to make sure that we're able to deliver um, bandwidth capacity to them uh, uh, at record speed um, because you know the cycle times of uh, weeks and months really don't work in this environment, right? You're, you're, you're talking about hours and days. So our focus really has been make sure that the healthcare facilities as well as these um, testing centers have uh, the capacities that they need as quickly as possible. Um, you know, the other dynamic that's involved here, Des, is the fact that these testing facilities are not 
in the four walls uh, always, right? Um, you've seen that testing facilities are popping up in parking lots, they're leveraging uh, maybe convention centers. So uh, you have to stand up infrastructure really quickly. So the healthcare, um, uh, healthcare companies are depending on us to uh, make sure that they can get their infrastructure up and running as quickly as possible. So what does that mean? That means um, you know, making sure that the healthcare workers that are out there have access to that data in a um, mobile environment. Um, so they can be very efficient. You know, if you if you have a long line of uh, people that are looking to get tested, having the tools in a mobile way, in shape of a tablet connected to our first net network, um, is really powerful. Also, making sure that they have all of the devices for their connectivity needs, whether it's voice or data. Um, we're enabling FirstNet for all of these connections, and you and I have talked about FirstNet before. FirstNet is essentially our private network that's been built for first responders. It has uh, priority, it has preemption, um, it's fast, it's basically um, you know, uh, a super high highway that is really built for our first responders, doctors and nurses. So we've been equipping them you know, with those tools, those devices, um, just to make sure that uh, they have everything that they need and they have the infrastructure stood up immediately. Um, you know, one of the things that we also did was uh, we worked very, very closely with the FirstNet uh, Authority and we looked at all of the COVID-19 uh, use cases and we quickly expanded the FirstNet eligibility to those, to those use cases. So that would be testing facilities, pharmaceutical labs, and uh, clinics. Um, you know, we have tremendous examples of uh, our employees going above and beyond. They see that they're serving, um, you know, people on the front line. So they've had a pretty strong sense of mission. We actually had uh, one of our, um, you know, account managers in Boston uh, go to a hospital and deliver all of the devices themselves and set up all of the mobile hotspots. So th there's a lot of tremendous stories of our people going above and beyond to service those on the front lines. Oh, indeed. And, you know, at t is no stranger to dealing with uh, crises, whether it's a storm or a tornado that rips out infrastructure. This is almost like a 24-7 tornado storm nationally that you've had to deal with. The, uh, you know, and, and, and the first net story just continues to fascinate me. It's such a great initiative. And I wish we had one here. I think it's a global need that emergency services of any form can have that there so that, that no matter what happens, they're able to function and, and, and run what they do. I'm interested in what you're seeing around the staff in hospitals. You mentioned one of your account uh, managers going in and installing kit themselves and, and um, you know, 10 points to Gryffindor on that front. I mean, that's just a great humanitarian act, action themselves individually. Uh, there's a Christmas bonus waiting to be happened. But, um, you know, with that in mind, I mean, obviously aware of, of what they did there. I mean, hospital staff themselves. Uh, and we think of those people that are probably a little outside of the direct healthcare providers. Uh, you know, we can't think about people that are in cleaning jobs, the sanitation, um, support staff, administration. They've all got uh, compounding challenges, and this is impacting each of them individually and professionally, creating a whole range of new pressures for, for them from just keeping things clean to keeping the processes running smoothly in organizations. What are you seeing out in the field, and what sorts of things have you been up to of late to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a fantastic uh, point, especially, you know, from a sanitation uh, standpoint. You think about... Uh, uh, you know, all of the people that have to go into these facilities and the need to make sure that uh, everything's been cleaned, everything's been wiped down, you don't have uh, the viruses, uh, um, you know, out there because there's just such a high risk of anybody walking in in an um, environment that's not fully sanitized for you to pick something up. Um, so certainly, um, you know, the sanitation workers uh, have been on the front lines. We've actually been doing some pretty uh, interesting uh, things there. We actually uh, partnered with a very innovative company um, called uh, Xenex. And uh, essentially what they do is they have these robots um, that kill germs in hospitals using UV lights. Um, and our partnership is essentially enabling the connectivity for these germ killing uh, robots, making sure that, you know, as they go and conduct uh, all of this work, all of the data is safely being transmitted back to their data center so they can analyze it and continue to get better. So uh, that's a use case, you know, that we're extremely proud of the fact that we're keeping uh, a lot of the people from harm's way and we're actually, you know, powering robots to go 
uh, do a lot of the work that actually is critical in this environment. Uh, I'll freely admit to you, and this is going to make you laugh, but when I first uh, read about some of that work you're doing with regard to the, the robots in hospitals, I had this mental George Jackson picture of little laser beams shooting individual viruses, but then I read further on and realized that it's, it's, it's a whole range of UV spread across the entire room. But uh, I, I had a good chuckle myself thinking, God, even at 52, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still imagining laser beams flying out of robots, right? Um, I mean, with regard to that whole theme around the hospital space, um, you know, there's no, there's no doubt there's a lot going on there. Um, but, but not just for the, for the um, healthcare workers and, and the support administration and cleaners and sanitation people around that, but also on the other side of the spectrum, and that is the patients um, who are in there and, and the people around them, their family. Um, you, know, we, you know, we know it's dangerous to go to hospital now if we have a family member ill or we're not even allowed to in most cases because we might bring it into the hospital, we might infect them. Uh, they're uh, kept in a small contained environment so they don't infect anyone else. So I think there's another whole dynamic on this that, that, that's on the other end of the spectrum from the consumer ex experience point of view or the, the patient side of things. Um, what's happening in that side of the world as far as you're, what you're seeing and, and what you're working with? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's a really interesting dynamic as in the sense that, you know, humans, we're communal creatures, right? When uh, a loved one is suffering, when a loved one is in pain, your immediate instinct is to be there. You want to be there physically with them. You want to console them. Uh, you, you want to comfort them. When you think about this environment with the COVID-19, um, that is not something that you want to do. It's, it's not safe for you. It's not safe for the environment that you come back to. So uh, it is a rewiring to know that uh, in, in this case, you know, uh, being there is actually not going and having that physical proximity. Um, so we've talked to a lot of hospitals around what could we do to enable that connection. And uh, essentially we've deployed tablets where um, you, know, you don't have visitation hours with tablets, right? You're able to video with your loved ones, whether you're an elderly uh, person um, you know, who would be severely at risk because you would uh, contact somebody else, being able to access your loved ones over video. That's been a great use case. One of the ones that we actually deployed at a hospital was, um, uh, you know, these this children's hospital, and it was the same dynamic. We couldn't have their parents uh, visit them, and think about you know being a parent and not being able to visit your child who's in pain. So this was perfect, where they just deployed tablets in uh, each of their wards, and uh, the kids were able to talk to their parents, video with their parents, video with their friends, video with their relatives. Uh, you know, the entire time so they didn't feel as alone. So that's, that's definitely been one that, uh, uh, that's emerged as, uh, you know, a use case in a lot of the uh, healthcare facilities. In many ways, it's rather fortuitous that we've become such a digitally connected society and we use so much social media and, and FaceTiming, screen timing anyway, uh, uh, both uh, family and friends. Uh, I mean, I, my mom lives uh, in a completely different state, so that's our native state for our kids to interact with her unless she can come and visit or vice versa. So uh, if there is any upside to any of this, that we were prepared for this in some ways, and now you've been able to respond to it by providing up uh, either the devices or the, the infrastructure and capacity, which I think is fantastic. Because as you said, there's nothing worse than having a member of your family there and not being able to see them. And even more critically, if it's your child, because it's just heartbreaking yeah. as a parent, I don't know if I could cope with that. I'd probably be breaking the hospital. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, yeah, speaking of digital connections, I mean, uh, one thing that comes to mind with this is the whole area of telehealth. And we spoke about this a couple of times before, and certainly on the podcast that you were on the other day. Um, and there's been an enormous, almost insane growth rate around the last couple of years just of telehealth and remote connectivity and remote diagnoses. Diagnoses, I mean, um, you know, what do you think is going to go happen in this whole space around the health industry with regard to telemedicine? And, and I wonder if you've got any predictions for growth or any areas that you've seen have sprouted out because of this, uh, in light of what you've just been talking about with the patient experience of, you know, family talking to family with that. Telehealth must be going through some, some interesting pivots with this, and, and I'd be really interested to see, hear what you've been seeing out there and get your thoughts on where this might take us, even post-COVID-19. Yeah. Um... You're absolutely right, Des. Last couple of years, we've seen tremendous adoption. Um, what I would tell you is, you know, the last uh, four to six weeks, we've seen a tremendous acceleration of that trend. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. My sister-in-law is a, a rheumatologist in Chicago. And uh, uh, as all of these, uh, you know, healthcare facilities are completely focused on the COVID-19 crisis, they've told all other specialists to move 
uh, every every non-critical consultation um, remote. So she's essentially, you know, she she used to do 100% of our consultations in person. Now she does 90% of her consultations remotely. Um, so COVID-19 is significantly accelerating uh, this uh, dynamic. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we, we've seen that a lot of the, a lot of our customers have come to us and they've asked for uh, devices, whether it's a tablet or a phone, to be able to equip the physicians, equip the caregivers that are no longer um, going to be coming into the facilities. They're encouraged to be able to um, you know, do their consultations remotely. So I think, uh, you know, we're only going to see the acceleration of that trend. As a matter of fact, we just recently uh, announced a partnership uh, with a company called Vital Tech. Um, and, and they're the ones who enable, um, you know, video calls, um, telehealth, um, uh, virtual care through their platform. So we like that platform a lot. Uh, we partnered with them and we basically provide connectivity to that platform. You know, it's still tablet agnostic, uh, uh, but we like the platform where we, and we see this uh, uh, acceleration of the trend and we decided that that's one that we absolutely want to go and invest. Uh, in the other one, uh, Des, I would say is I think we're going to continue to see explosion of, you know, IoT uh, in this field as well, whether that is, uh, you know, remote thermometers, blood pressure gauges, uh, electrocardiogram, I think uh, this is going to be a big trigger for us to start seeing a lot of innovation. As a matter of fact, over the last you know, 30, 60 days, we've seen a bunch of startups come to us and they've really uh, pivoted their business plans and they've focused on uh, you know, remote connectivity, uh, being able to do remote monitoring. So I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. It's a trend that we've seen uh, that, that has been going, uh, that has been increasing, but I I think we've identified a rapid acceleration in the last 60 days, which I don't believe will stop. No, and it's unfortunate is that the innovation is having to take place uh, with regard to dealing with this crisis. Uh, what really excites me from, from some of the things you're talking about there is that post crisis, we're gonna be able to put these out in the field in places where they were probably needed before, there just wasn't necessarily a business case to support them. I know, for example, you know, America's no different to Australia in being a very big piece of dirt, lots of people and in, in very, you know, just, uh, widely uh, spread out areas and certainly in Australia we have had to develop a, a flying doctor service to get airplanes in and out of country areas because we don't even have hospitals there. So I think this is going to be an amazing opportunity to bring a, a greater level of healthcare to areas that didn't have it before, but also potentially uh, speed up the process and reduce the cost. Uh, you know, we see this in enterprise spaces of fail and fail and fast and, and different types of innovations. I love the fact that it's now happening in healthcare and, and telemedicine I think is going to be great, particularly when you see things like haptic feedback. Further into that space, like one of the things that I was really curious about, and I was watching some something the other day on this that really piqued my, my interest, and that was that um, we often forget about the medical researchers and the people who are actually doing the testing itself. Like you go, and if you are real for any reason, which is unfortunate, and you do have to be tested. So people in the labs, people doing the testing, people doing the research, maybe even looking for a cure, for example, which would be fantastic. Um, what are you seeing around that whole space of that sort of fairly niche need, but really, really critical point into the stick of people who just have to get the test done on time and quickly and can't have any failure of infrastructure need to move the data no matter what. Yeah, um, just uh, just to finish your last thought with regards to telemedicine, you, you did bring a really good point, Des, in the sense that, uh, you know, we used to see uh, telemedicine adoption grow pretty significantly in uh, rural areas. Now, uh, since this crisis, we've started seeing it, you know, really evolve and explode in uh, urban, suburban areas as well. So I think that that was a valid point that I wanted to reinforce. Um, you know, with regards to uh, the healthcare workers that are working on a vaccine or a cure, as, as you know, these scientists uh, uh, are working around the clock. There's uh, a lot of, you know, public private partnership aspects of it. Um, there's researchers that are spread, uh, you know, all over the country. So um, the the solve from our perspective was how do we give them the appropriate collaboration tools? How do we give them access to information that they all need in a um, you know, safe and high availability uh, medium? And uh, essentially for us, that meant that um, you know, partner with somebody that is one of our very close go-to-market partners. We were working with IBM to actually provide one of the government agencies 
a virtual desktop solution that uh, uh, gives you secure access to uh, this research uh, remotely. Um, you know, as you know, it's, uh, it's important for us to keep them safe. Uh, we want to limit the possibility of uh, them contracting or spreading the virus. So it's, it's just the virtual desktop solution enables them to be able to access the information without having to go in that environment because somebody else is, um, you know, putting that in the cloud. So the way we do it is uh, we basically give them access to the IBM cloud uh, for government through VPN. Uh, I believe, you know, current capacity right now is 600 people at the same time can actually access this VDI cloud. So our answer to this has been, how do we, you know, enable safe, uh, reliable, um, and, uh, you know, high throughput communication for them? I, I find that very exciting because you know, we, we all know that when we're in the enterprise world, whether it's medium to large business, we all join video conference calls and you have that funny thing of, you know, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can't connect. The plug is not working. I just can't comprehend how that would function for from the consumer space to researchers. So I, I think this is an amazing initiative and congratulations on it because if they're under the stress of working 24 seven, 365, doing testing, trying to save lives, the last thing they want is a, is a product that just isn't going to connect or isn't going to let them share data or just, you know, whatever to collaborate. Uh, because I think, you know, every minute counts in some of these scenarios. So I think that's an amazing initiative. Um, when we think about uh, let's, you know, and the other, at the end of that process, I think there's also a, a conversation we had around prevention, for example, right? Um, and particularly the impact outside the direct healthcare system. Um, prevention is something that everyone can do. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, physical or social distancing, uh, a lot of us talk about social distancing. I'm a big fan of describing it as physical distancing because that kind of changes the paradigm because I still want to be socially close to people, but physically distance. Um, you know, whether it's basically stay at home or wash your hands better. But when we think about some of the key industries that are impacted as a result of that, you know, retail, for example, in your world, I mean, you know, there's a big change for them just in keeping the business running, but then also dealing with the, the consumers coming to their physical sites. I mean, certainly with the likes of AT&T stores, for example. Um, I, I'd love to learn more about what, if anything, you've seen out there with regard to that pivot where outside the healthcare system where organizations are providing critical services, whether it's just a regular uh, food store outlet or a pharmaceutical or just a general retailer, what, what, what have you seen out there with regard to what they're able to do and how you can help them limit the exposure to other people with regard to the, the contagious virus and, and how they're just responding to this in general? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that I've, uh, uh, th this is a word that I've heard, I don't know if it's an industry word just yet, but uh, a lot of my customers have started referring to the new environment as safe retail. Uh, right. And, you know, what, what they want to convey is exactly what you said in a, um, you know, physically distant environment um, in, in a world where you need to make sure that uh, um, you, you only have a certain number of people going into a facility. Um, you know, how do you think about, uh, how do you think about retail? So for example, some of our customers have reached out to us and they said, okay, um, can we work with you and can we come up with some tools where our clients are able to log in and they're able to see that, okay, this is a busy time for the retail store, there's quite a few people there. There's actually a line outside. So maybe this is not a good time for me to go in. Um, so, you know, tools around customer experience based on this uh, environment. You know, we mentioned we're doing a lot of good work um, with, robot, with robots. And just like Xenex, there's actually a company in this space called Brain. And uh, they have an excellent robotic solution um, that is, uh, predominantly working on use cases in retail, but there's certainly more applicability as well. And these re robots are used for, um, you know, inventory reviews, for restocking, and again, they're powered by AT&T connectivity. So that's been, um, you know, that's been a really uh, great solution, especially if you think about, you know, some of the challenges that retail is uh, facing right now with uh, uh, inability to keep certain items in stock and having to, you know, rapidly turn over uh, inventory. So these robots uh, have been tremendously helpful in terms of giving them quick framing of, you know, what's really going on in the store and how does their supply chain need to reflect, uh, you know, that dynamic. I don't think uh, that's going to be able to help us with regards to this uh, immense shortage of toilet paper, though. I don't think any robot is going to be able to forecast that for you. So that's, that's going to continue to be a challenge regardless of what type of technology we deploy. 
Indeed. Who uh, who on in the world could have predicted that that was the number one fear factor people had? But I guess when you think it through, maybe that makes sense. I was um, you know, recently had the opportunity to be at the National Retail Federation uh, uh, event in New York with the AT&T team. And there were a couple of things that really stood out to me uh, that that event that I think could apply here as well as your intelligent uh, smart kiosks and the smart wayfinding solution. Uh, yeah. It just seemed to me that there would be absolute big wins. I, I love the idea of going to the store and using the wayfinding solution, whether it's a hospital or store or retail or whatever, to get the shortest route and the smartest route. And I imagine that eventually you can feed back data into that as to where people actually are now and reroute me through a quieter area. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, it's great that you mentioned that because not only in retail stores and hospitals, uh, you know, I don't know about Australia, but if you go to hospitals here, large campuses, several buildings. So uh, figuring out how you how to navigate your way to go visit your loved one, um, you know, having a wayfinding solution definitely makes that experience so much easier. Indeed. Well, the, you know, everything you're talking about assures me that we're, we're in, heading in the right direction. And, and, and again, congratulations on both your personal pivot to having to work at home, but although, as you said, you, you travel a lot, so it's kind of a, a natural state for you, although you've got the house full. And congratulations to your team on responding to this and the organization, at t Business as a whole. I mean, you, you've, you've got so much going on. I, I just can't imagine how you juggle it all, but, you know, thank you for what you're doing. And, and it's been great to catch up with you and learn more about it. Uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing further updates soon, uh, having you back on the show, because there's just so much to glean from this. And the big thing for me, as we were talking when we were off air, is for organizations to be able to learn from what you're doing and, and, and have some takeaways that they can actually action from what you've been sharing today, which is exciting, because they're all struggling to cope with it personally, professionally, and organizationally. So I think it's great that you've been able to share so much insight into kind of what you've been doing so far and what people can look to you to do going forward, because this, this isn't over. It's not going to be over for a little while. Uh, and even when it is over, such as the health solutions with telemedicine, as you said, there's still going to be so many applications for those post COVID-19. Absolutely. Uh, no, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to tell our story. I mean, I'll, I'll finish where I started, which is, uh, um, you know, really grateful to our employees uh, and their tremendous sense of mission and going and supporting um, the first responders, the doctors, nurses, a lot of the essential workers that are out there that are risking their lives. So, um, you know, we're, we're here to support them. Uh, we did talk about FirstNet. One of the things that we just uh, released, hopefully you got to see it, in appreciation of uh, our doctors and nurses, we're actually offering uh, three free months of service. So anybody who goes, any doctor or nurse uh, goes and signs up for uh, first net, we're essentially giving them the next three months free. So that's just something that we announced uh, yesterday. Hopefully you got to see it. Um, you know, we're making sure that uh, we spread the message across all of the, um, you know, healthcare uh, facilities. That's just, you know, as a company, our way of showing appreciation and letting them know that, um, you know, we're in this fight with them together. That's an amazing initiative and, and, and congratulations on that as well. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know you've got a busy day, so I'll let you go. I really appreciate you making time to catch up with me. Thank you again for so many personal and professional insights. Uh, uh, fascinating to see it play out, uh, as unfortunate it is around this particular crisis, but uh, we know we're in good hands. And um, yeah, just stay safe, keep it up, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Des. Thanks, Zee.